So this week, we are talking about refocusing, filling our cup up. Now when I talk about focus, I want you to visualize yourself as a cup. And when we're focused, our cup gets filled. It gets filled up so much it overflows. It affects those around us, and hopefully in a good way. But if we lose focus, our cup can become empty. We can't affect those around us, and when we try, we can easily harm or not do good. It's important to be focused. It's important to be filled. We ourselves realize this, don't we? That there's times in our lives when our cup doesn't really feel like it's filled. Like we're not really focused with what's going on. We go on vacations to relax. We go to gatherings like the youth gathering this year. We go on retreats. And by the way, there's a marriage retreat coming up, so talk to Pastor Scott about that. We even go to confident, uh, conferences. Now some have noted that Vicar has talked with a little more pep in his step the last couple of weeks and have asked what's going on. Well, at the end of December, I went to a conference. The conference was called Urbana. It was put on by InterVarsity. And I can tell you, I was probably one of the few LCMS Lutherans at this gathering. I struggled while I was there by what I heard, by what I saw. Things were working inside of me. I was judging, trying to figure things out. I went to this conference to be filled up, but instead I was feeling like I was being emptied. But then, halfway through, I got a chance to visit my family for Christmas. I got to see my nieces. And when I drove out to see them, I started thinking about this emptiness inside of me. And when I saw them, spent time with them, I realized something. What matters most for my nieces, as far as I'm concerned, is that they have a relationship with Jesus. That they're able to call him Lord and Savior as they grow up. And that's what I realized, that is what is important. And so I went back to the conference, I started to sing the songs. I started listening, not judging, but realizing the focus is not on myself, but on Jesus. And when I thought about that, I realized at this conference, I was surrounded by 16,000 people who were praying, singing that Jesus was their Lord. And they wanted to share his gospel with others. So yeah, when I came back from this conference, after I dealt with the plank in my own eye, Vicar was filled up. I'm ready to share, to serve ascension. How do you focus? How do you get filled up? For many of you, you come to ascension for that very purpose. The focus on our Father, our God to be filled up as we deal with the week ahead. And some of you who are visitors, you might be here trying to figure out, is Ascension that place that will fill you up? That place that will fill your cup up to deal with the week ahead. How I can answer that is this. Ascension is a place where the gospel is proclaimed, where we focus on the Word of God where we teach and proclaim what Jesus has done for us in our lives. So yes, this is a place where you can be filled up. Now for each of us, there's different ways that we get to be filled up as we hear the gospel. For some, it's hearing the music. And here at Maple, it would be the band. You might come to hear our pastors preach and be filled up the, with the word when they speak it. It might be that you love coming to see your friends and your family here at church. All of these things are good things that help us hear the gospel, to listen. But I have a question. But what if? What if Kevin's not here and there's no music going on? Or Kevin never practiced and it didn't sound that great. Are you going to leave here not focused on God? What happens if you came to hear the sermon from the pastors and you're stuck with the vicar. Here's the thing. As a vicar, we're students. I'm, we're all learning. But we're not like our pastors yet. We're still trying to develop. So what happens if you get some new kid trying to preach and it just wasn't right? Are you going to go home not filled up? 
What happens if you come here to the church this week and guess what? Your friends aren't here. Your family couldn't make it. Does that mean the gospel wasn't proclaimed? See, what happens when we start focusing on our own experiences, our own emotions, we lose sight, we lose focus of what's important. And that's where our gospel reading takes us. Now, it starts off with this first verse. About eight days after Jesus said this. So a week ago, Jesus said something. But in order to read the rest of the story, we have to know what that was. So what happened? Well, eight days ago, Jesus asked the disciples this question. Who do people say that I am? Who I am? Well, the disciples, they mentioned, some say that you're Elijah. And eventually, Peter makes this comment. God's Messiah. God's chosen. And from there, Jesus starts to teach. He explains to them that the Son of Man must suffer. This is the first time in the Gospels that Jesus is talking about his passion, his death to the disciples. And when he gets done talking about this, he ends saying this. Truly I tell you, some of you standing here will not taste death until you see the kingdom of God. Now we get back to our story. So that was a week ago. So Jesus is taking his disciples, Peter, John, and James, up the mountain to pray. Now, as far as somebody who knows the importance of focus and filling your cup up, it's Jesus. Throughout the Gospels, we hear how Jesus steps back from the large crowds, goes up the mountains, and prays. He goes up there and focuses on the Father. And this time, he brings the disciples with him. I don't know about you guys, but in the Gospels, whenever Jesus is praying and brings the disciples, typically they fall asleep. Just something we notice. Well, as Jesus is praying, and as the disciples are actually sleeping at this point, as he was praying, Jesus' appearance, his face changes. His clothes become bright as a flash of lightning. Something is happening to Jesus. The disciples are kind of starting to wake up, And all of a sudden, two men show up, Moses and Elijah. Now, all of a sudden, the disciples are starting to wake up going, what's going on right now? So why are Moses and Elijah showing up for all this? Now, the quick answer is to say, the law and the prophets. But I want to take a second to focus on each individual. So the person by Jesus' right is Moses. So who's Moses? The greatest prophet of God's people, the lawgiver who gave the Ten Commandments. Yet Moses didn't get to go in the promised land. That's what we just read a couple minutes ago. He was being punished. He was not allowed to go in. This is God's greatest prophet. What happened? Well, at the end of their long journey, God's people started complaining, which they do very often, and they wanted something to drink. So they went up to Moses and said, you're not a leader for us because we're going to die of thirst. And God must not be with us. So Moses goes to God, what do I do? I got these people who are always complaining. And God said, don't worry about it. Speak, and the rocks will give water. Well, the people kept complaining, and Moses got so irritated, he grabbed his staff and struck the rocks. Water flowed. The people could drink. And the people looked up and said, Moses is our leader. Kind of forgot something, didn't they? And, Jesus, and God went up to Moses and said, Moses, I told you all you had to do was speak. And instead, you had to show something. Out of anger, Moses lost focus on God and focused on himself. So he couldn't enter the promised land. And yet... Here Moses is, standing, looking at the fulfillment of the law. Jesus in all of his glory. And where is he seeing this? In the promised land. Next person next to, the other person next to Jesus is Elijah. Elijah is considered the second greatest prophet after Moses. Elijah is famous for when he went up to Mount Carmel 
got an altar and had God bring down fire onto an altar covered in water. He even had all the Baal prophets killed. He ran to the palace to confront the king and queen in the hope they would repent after seeing what God has done. But what happened? The queen gave out a death sentence for Elijah. So he took off in fear and ran. He went so far south, he got to the mountain where Moses was, where Moses had the Ten Commandments. And he began to pray to God. Did he pray for help? No. He prayed and told God, God, your covenant is broken. Your people have abandoned you. It is all over. In fact, I'm better off dead. Kill me. Moses took his focus off of God out of anger. Elijah took his focus off out of fear. Yet here's Elijah standing right next to Jesus in all his glory, showing the true remnant of Israel, the one and only Israel right in front of him who is Jesus. That God does fulfill all of his promises, including the covenant. We couldn't, but God could. Lastly in this whole situation are the disciples. Now let's think about this. Your teacher has just became godlike. His clothes are all bright, you can't really see his face. Most people will be probably pretty scared. Most likely, John and James are keeping their head down. That's what most people would do. But then there's Peter. Peter's not like most people. And as Moses and Elijah are about to leave, Peter's going, I should say something. I got to say something. What should I do? What, 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 what can I do here? He's thinking outside, outside of his head, what's the best thing to do? And this is what he says. Master, it's good for us to be here. Let's put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And I love what Luke adds right here. He did not know what he was saying. Peter has this problem. It's called not having a filter, where his brain and his mouth are tied together, so all his thoughts are what he speaks. There's no processing. You might remember a sermon I did a couple weeks ago talking about the character, character faults of Peter. We'll add this one to it. But again, it sounds really familiar to somebody else I know with no filter. But that's Peter. And what's he trying to do? He's trying to do something. He realizes this great thing happening, so I have to be a part of it. I must do something. His focus is not on his Lord, but on himself. What did Jesus say eight days ago? And Jesus told them, I truly tell you, some of you who are standing here will not taste death before you see the kingdom of God. Jesus talked about this was going to happen. Yet Peter was more focused on himself. So why did Jesus bring the disciples with him? And what I think is to have them focus at the task of hand. Focus on him. To be filled up. Because everything that's happening right now in this gospel is leading to another mountain. And on that mountain, Jesus is going to the cross to die. This is not going to be an easy task. The disciples are going to lose focus throughout this journey. By the end of it, their cup will be dry. Because this all leads to here. Of course, the question is, as a good Lutheran, you always got to preach Jesus on the cross. But why talk about it right here? Because that's the discussion that Moses and Elijah are having. They're talking about Jesus' departure. They spoke about his departure. Now, the Greek word that's used here, you all know it. In fact, most of you have probably read a little bit from the book with the Greek title. The word that they're talking about here, that Jesus is about to have his exodus. So it is a departure. Jesus is about to go through exactly what Moses did with God's people in Egypt. But there's a difference. With Moses and the Exodus, God's people were freed from slavery, from men. Jesus is here to free God's people from a different bondage. A bondage from sin. Now, it's not of chains, 
but actually sin does something to us that we don't even realize. It makes it so that we focus on ourselves. It's impossible to look to God. It's impossible to look to God in our sinful state. Because in the end, it's all about me. That's what Christ's exodus is all about, is freeing God's people so they can look to him. Look to God and be filled with their cup. Because with sin in our lives, sometimes when our our cup is empty, we think it's full. And it can be devastating. So what happens? What are we supposed to do, then, if Jesus is going to free us from this exodus? What's our part? Of course, the answer is, we don't have a part in it. But there is something for us to do. And this is what God tells the disciples. A voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son whom I've chosen. Listen to him. That's a very important action. Listen. I can hear something. And when I hear something, I'm saying I know it's there. I recognize there's something going on. But when I listen, that means I take my focus off myself and on that person. I let them affect my heart and my mind. God is telling the disciples that they need to listen, not just hear. So how do we focus? How do we get filled ourselves? Is to listen. To take our focus off ourselves and to let God work on our heart and on our mind. Now, how do we do that here in church? Well, in case Kevin doesn't show up or in case Kevin forgets, it's not about his playing. It's about listening to the words that we're singing, what they have to do about us and what God has done for each of you. Yeah, you come to church to hear the pastors preach, but unfortunately, it's the vicar. Or maybe it's pastor on a bad night. Those can happen. But if we listen to the words, we hear about the proclamation of Jesus, of that gospel, what God has done for you, how much he cares and loves for you. So you might show up to church, and your best buddy might not be there. Your family can't make it. But what's going to happen shortly for all of us, you're going to hear everybody in this room confess together. You're going to hear everybody receive forgiveness You've heard God's word, and you're going to hear God's blessing in your life. So you're not alone. You have a family around you. So that's how we focus. And when we focus, our cup is filled. In fact, it overflows. And when it's overflowing, that's when we have effect on people around us. You want to share your faith with others? Focus on our Lord. And you'll be able to spread that good news to those around us. I would like to close here with an invitation. If you guys don't know, the vicar has to do a project every year. And this year's project starts off with the survey, the Hope hope Ascension, focus on what's going on with our lives. To see where we need to be filled up. Brent Bressler will be up here shortly to talk more about it. But I invite all of you to the website, it's under blog, where you can fill out the survey. Because each of you who fills it out, no matter what age, is a voice to the future of ascension. As we hear God's word, as he comes to us, both on our hearts and on our minds, share that with us. Amen?